This is the Comics Alternative Interviews, conversations with Magdalene Visaggio and Sonny Liu. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews. I'm Derek, and on this episode, I have the pleasure of talking with Magdalene Visaggio and Sunny Liu. Their new collaboration, Eternity Girl, began this month, coming out from DC Comics' Young Animal Line, and I have a great time talking with both of them about this new title. But before we get to those conversations, I want to let all of you know that this episode of the Comics Alternative Interviews is brought to you by the great folks at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to their website, dcbservice.com, for all of your comics pre-ordering needs. There, you're going to find all DC, Marvel, Image, and Dark Horse titles at 40% off of the cover price if you pre-order. For all of the other publishers, you'll find that those discounts are anywhere from 20 to 35% off of the cover price, and every single month you're going to find some unbelievable specials. Sometimes those specials could be as much as 45% off the cover price, sometimes 50% off cover, but every now and again you can find discounts that are a little more impressive than that. And since I'm talking with Magdalene Visaggio and Sunny Lou today, if you search for them right now on DCB Service, you will find that issue number three of their Eternity Girl is 40% off of the cover price. But if you want to save even more, go for the Young Animals Bundle, which is 50% off of the cover price. That's four titles for just $7.96, and that includes Eternity Girl. You can also find the trade collection of Magdalene Visaggio's Quantum Teens or Go at 30% off at the cover price. And if you're a fan of Sonny Lou's work, right now you can get Malinky Robot and Volumes of Dr. Fate, a work that he created with Paul Levitz, at 40% off at the cover price. And there's his collaboration with Gene Yang, The Shadow Hero, at 30% off at the cover price. However you dice it, you really can't beat the wonderful prices at Discount Comic Book Service. Go to dcbservice.com. They will take care of all of your comics pre-ordering needs. And after you do get your titles there, please be sure to send them an email and tell them that the two guys with PhDs sent you. A couple of weeks ago, we got the first issue of Eternity Girl, the latest title in DC's Young Animal line. Written by Magdalene Visaggio and with art by Sunny Lou, this is a title that combines parts of Element Girl with a dash of Kid Eternity and mixes things up in an offbeat way that fits perfectly in the young animal world. I wanted to talk with both Mags and Sunny about this new series, and both kindly agreed to be on the podcast. Listeners of the Comics Alternative will know that both creators have been on the show before. I spoke with Mags briefly at Heroes Con a couple of years ago, and then Gwen and I interviewed Sonny around the publication of his landmark book, The Art of Charlie Chan Huck Chai, a work that went on to win three Eisner Awards last year. Best Writer Artist, Best U.S. Edition of International Material Asia, and Best Publication Design. Since Sonny lives halfway around the world, in Singapore, we had a challenging time trying to find a common occasion when all of us could be online and talk on Skype at the same time. So we decided to break up the interview where I would talk with both creators separately, asking both similar questions, while at the same time focusing on each one's unique contribution to the series. I begin with Mags Visaggio asking her about the genesis of Eternity Girl, as well as the differences between creating for Black Mass Comics and now working for DC. After that, you'll hear my conversation with Sonny Liu. We talk about his visual approach to this unstable composite character and how his art style is particularly suited to the title. I also ask Sonny what it's like to be a multiple Eisner Award winning artist and how his professional life may have changed since last year's accolades. I had an insightful conversation with both Mags and Sonny, and I'd like to share those with you right now. Hi, 
I'm happy to have back on the Comics Alternative, Magdalene Visaggio. She is the writer of the new DC series in the Young Animal line, Eternity Girl. Mags, welcome back on the show. Thanks for having me. Now, I've had you on the Comics Alternative in the past, but we talked just briefly. I think it was Heroes Con 2016. This is around the time that Kim and Kim first came out. Yeah. Yeah, and it was it was interesting because I think at the time I hadn't read Kim and Kim, but someone who worked at my local comic shop at the time was raving about it. And then I think a week after that, I was at Heroes Con and I passed you, so I had to talk to you about that. Uh, yeah, um, it's hard to believe it's freaking been two years since the book came out. Yeah, I mean, a lot has happened with you in that time. Um now, you had been, I mean, obviously, there was the initial four-issue run of Kim and Kim, and then there was the other four-issue run, Kim and Kim, Love is a Battlefield, and you had Quantum, Teens, or Go. Now, those are Black Mass titles, but but now this is something in D.C. Are you finding that this is a whole other ball field now that you're playing in? Um, it's a very different comic-making experience in a lot of ways. It's, 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 um, so Black Mask is very do-it-yourself. Um, it's a really small company. It's really just the one guy. And that means that a lot of things that a publisher would traditionally handle is handled by the creative teams. Um, everything for coordination, you know, coordinating uh, production, marketing, scheduling, that kind of thing. That's all the production team, more or less. Um, <clears throat> with DC, it's very much, you know, you just like, you kind of turn in your scripts and then everything's just handled. You know, so it's a... Um, it's a really different experience. It's, I've I've uh, been equating working at Young Animal to working with Black Mask if Black Mask had money, <laughs> um, like to hire a staff. So like, because like it's it's because with Gerard at the helm, it still got that kind of like rock and roll ethos. Mm-hmm. And we we're we're given just a truly immense amount of creative freedom. Um, I haven't really gotten much in the way of of notes from dc on my on my work since the book was greenlit like the process of getting it greenlit was a whole thing with a ton of back and forth between me and my editor and with corporate you know like we had to deal with dc but we also kind of deal with warner brothers a little bit so like it, that's a whole thing getting a book through um but since it's since you know we've actually started production it's, it's been it's been very chill it's been a really chill process that i would very much describe as feeling a lot like working with black mask hmm. where it's um, just the, the, where there's, there's not a ton of like oversight. They just give you the, the freedom to like tell the story that you're interested in. And maybe that's just because I'm doing work that they're happy with, that I'm not getting a lot of pushback on it, but um, I'm not, it's been really, um, it's been a really great experience. <clears throat> I've had more involved creative processes at smaller pubs, to be honest. Hmm. Now, this first issue of Eternity Girl came out a couple of weeks ago, and one of the things I noted is in the very back of that first issue, uh, Gerard Way does mention that you know Eternity Girl is a new title within the context of Young Animal Phase 2, and he noted that it is it seemed to be perfectly suited for the Young Animal line. Now, I'm curious, when you came up with this idea for Eternity Girl – uh, what was the pitch like? I mean, how did you get Gerard Way interested in bringing this into his larger idea for Young Animal? Well, I mean, I didn't. So, um, they, okay. So my involvement with Young Animal goes back to, I want to say, Baltimore Comic Con last in 2016, when Justin Jordan kind of introduced me to um, Jamie Rich, who was at the time the senior editor of the of the imprint. <clears throat> Excuse me. and. Jamie was pretty impressed with me and he offered me a backup slot doing this like three pager in an issue of shade, the changing girl. <clears throat> and so I did that and the, res- his response to it was really good. Like Jamie really loved it. He thought it was a really smart script. Um, and it got some limited critical attention. It's a backup in a, in a, you know, in a young animal book. It's not going to be, you know, it's not going to be like <clears throat> shaking the world, but right. Um, it did well enough and, and got enough of a response that when I came to Jamie, uh, a few, I don't know. I mean, to be honest, I, actually, I guess I started pitching it before the book even came out. So I guess it was just based on his reception to it. 
so I came to Jamie and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm glad you really like this attorney girl short that I did by, I mean, this element girl short that I did, but I kind of still have like more that I want to do with that character. And so I originally started pitching it as an element girl book <clears throat> for a variety of reasons. We ended up going with the original, an original character. Um, but the pitching process was, uh, uh, I mean, pretty straightforward. I just kind of, I wrote up a two page outline of what I wanted the book to be, um, while on a, uh, train ride to Washington DC to visit my sister for Thanksgiving. And I just kind of sent it in and Jamie was really into it. And then it was just a matter of getting Gerard's attention and Gerard's kind of hard to pin down. He's a busy guy, you know, he's, he's writing Doom Patrol and he's still kind of a rock star, you know? Mm -hmm. So it took, it took a little bit to get Gerard on board just because it took a little bit to get his attention. Yeah. So, but once Gerard was on board, it was the very smooth sailing. We just had to get, um, DC on board, which was not hard. Like DC was very enthusiastic about the book. I actually ran into Dan DiDio at I um at a convention last year. After like I think within a couple of days of it getting the official green light, and I just kind of was like just kind of gushing. And I'm just like, oh, I just want to like thank you so much for this opportunity and blah blah blah. You know the crap you say. And he was just like he was so excited about the story. He was so excited about the book and the way to contribute to young animal. And uh, so, I mean, all told, it was a lengthy pitch process, but it wasn't a hard one. Hmm. Now, one of the things that strikes me about Eternity Girl that would be quite different from some of the other titles in the young animal line is that you really don't have the historical baggage, if we want to call it that, that some of the other creators have. I mean, we do have a new incarnation of the Doom Patrol, but there has been such a thing as the Doom Patrol in the past in a variety of different ways. Uh, you know, same thing with some of the other characters in the new animal line, like Cave Carson. And, you know, Shade the Changing Girl or Woman used to be Shade the Changing Man. So there was you know quite a bit of backstory and history that I think the creators had to keep in mind when coming up with these latest incarnations. You don't have that same restriction, uh, do you? I mean— Except that I do because the started as an element girl book and in a lot of ways uh, I'm, I'm still proceeding with the original plan. And so it doesn't have the continuity baggage, but you have to, you know, understand what the books in dialogue with. So the books in dialogue with Sandman, the books in dialogue with kid eternity. Um, this is kind of a kid eternity adjacent project. I see. Um, and that's stuff that's going to come out more and more over time. I mean, yeah, so it, it definitely, it doesn't have the same kind of baggage, but we're, we're still operating very much within the legacy of DC. This isn't something brand new. And that was kind of part of the point of doing those backups the way I did them. Um, in, so for, for anyone listening who doesn't know, in um, Mill Corps, in the first four parts, it was a five-part series, we had a little two-page Eternity Girl backups at the end of each one. Um, that sort of like walked through this character's fictitious publication history with like talk about who the creative teams were and there was like some drama in it and, and just in terms of like the background information and the whole point of all of that was that I just wanted to I wanted to sort of cement Eternity Girl as being part of the comics legacy you know like that she is in dialogue with this whole history of comics that's come before her mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I hear a couple things here. One, that Eternity Girl is – it's kind of different from Doom Patrol in that it's not a clear um, retelling, if you will, in ways that um, – you know, some, some of the, I guess the other young animal lines are with Eternity Girl, though, you're kind of, you're bringing in some of the DC history, but in a way that kind of amalgamates different figures or histories. And, th and yeah, th to an extent. Yeah. And then the other thing that um, strikes me about Eternity Girl, you mentioned the two pagers in the Milk Wars issues. I was really struck by those but for, for on a variety of levels. You know, one is I was really pleased to see that you were writing in such a way to create a history for this character, Carolyn Sharp, Eternity Girl, that seemed to actually have a real history in the past. But another thing that struck me about that is reading those two pagers, 
where the visual style shifts from one issue of Milk Wars to another, I couldn't help but think of Sonny Liu's The Art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai. So I, I was curious if this idea for those two pages in Milk Wars sprung from you wanting Sonny to do what he did so well in that Eisner Award winning book. Yes and yes and no. And so the first I'm going to say is the no, because I love doing shit like that. Um, <laughs> I've been toying with doing something along those lines for a really long time. And I've had a few artists that I've talked to about it. I and mean, we just weren't able to get anything together. But so after Sony joined the, joined the, the project, he sent me a copy of the art of Charlie Chan Chai, which is, I swear to God, one of the best single books I've ever read. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> And I was so impressed by how much of a chameleon he is, and in particular how he recreated Frank Miller um, in the toward the back of the book when he was doing his um, his Dark Knight Returns pastiche. Mm-hmm. And I was like, "Oh, that's so cool!" And so then when um, when Jamie is like, "Well, we want to do these backups," I was like, "I have just the fucking idea because Sonny, this is the cool thing about working with Sonny is he can handle anything I throw at him. So I'm throwing him, you know, some weird ass stuff at him in these scripts and he's just nailing it. And so <clears throat> based on the fact that I knew that he could, that he had this ability to like recreate, you know, other people's styles, if not to the point that it looked like them, but at least to the point that it felt like them mm-hmm. could capture those moods so perfectly. I was like, well, I, I, I really want to do this kind of like moving through, you know, the character's history. <clears throat> It really ties into a lot of what the book is going to end up being about, which is, you know, um, I'm not going to get too much into that, but like, there's definitely a strong metafictional element to, to attorney to girl. And so the, the idea of previous incarnations of her is something that's already built into attorney to girl from day one. Um, yeah. So Sonny, excuse me. So Sonny's ability to do that, like, uh, really just sort of opened up the door, I guess, to an idea I'd already been, ha- I'd already been, uh, you know, thinking about a lot. Huh. Now I don't want you to give anything away that you shouldn't about future issues of eternity girl. But one of the things I noted in the milk wars backups was again, the shift in style, visual style, which is very appropriate. There wasn't that as near as much variation in the art style in this first issue of eternity girl. It's there at times in subtle ways, But I'm curious, given the nature of this character, Carolyn Sharp, and how she seems to be both, I guess, in the physical form and also uh, in an existential way, kind of trapped between or among different worlds, are we going to see different visual style shifts with the way that Sunny draws Eternity Girl in further issues? So the answer is already yes. Okay. I don't want to I don't want to give like a ton away. Um, sure. But I mean, there's already some, there's already like some of those like retro style panels in issue one. So that's already a part of the visual language of the book. Right. But this may be even more pronounced as the story unfolds. Perhaps. Per- perhaps. We'll see. Now, now tell me, how did uh, you get linked up with Sonny? Um, okay. So once we had the green, actually, even before we ever had the green light on the pitch, because that was part of how we got it. So we're developing the book together, me, Jamie, and Gerard. And this is based on the initial pitch. Like, we're just trying to figure out, well, what do we do? How, who, how are we going to pitch this? How do we refine this pitch? What's the team? And so I originally pitched Paulina Ganesho, who did our B cover for the um, for our duties, because she was the person I'd been working with on the Element Girl short. And I was just like, well, I want to carry that over. But Gerard thought that she wasn't, she didn't have the right, I guess, darkness for the story. Like, it's such a grim book that it was like it needed someone who could, like, that that he thought could sell that a little more. And we sort of were, were batting names around all over the place. Um, like, at one point, we were talking about Mike Diodato. We were talking about Chris Anka. Uh, Anka? I don't know how to pronounce his last name. Just, we, we were all over the place. We were looking at Brett Parsons. Um, just so many names. And at one point I suddenly remembered how much I'd really loved Sonny Liu's work on Dr. Fate. Like it it was such a unique book that wasn't like anything else that was being published. 
and it didn't look like anything that was being published. Now that I found that really interesting. <clears throat> so, um, I just floated the name and everyone went, that's perfect. And, uh, Jamie got in touch with him and brought him on board. Hmm. Now, had you been familiar with Sonny's earlier work, like, uh, Malinky Robot or My Faith with Frankie? No, I really just knew him from, um, from Dr. Fate. Hmm. And, that, and I think that if I knew him from the earlier stuff, I might not have thought of him because what really impressed me with Dr. Fate was the way it was an unconventional superhero story. And that's what this was. So that's kind of, that was the connection I made. So if I had known him from, you know, my faith in Frankie, then, then I'm not sure I would have made that, made that leap. Huh. So you hadn't even read his work with Jean Louis Yang, Shadow Hero? No, I just knew him from Dr. Fate. Wow. That, that is interesting. So I know that you guys have, have met, you met last year at uh, San Diego, correct? Yeah. I mean, physically <laughs> met. Uh, so how, how do you work together? I mean, he's halfway across the world. Uh, what means do you guys use to go back and forth? Mostly everything goes through editorial. Like I turn in my, that's the thing. Like that's the kind of the weird thing about, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I was about to make a general statement, but this is my only like big two thing. So I'm not going to make a big general statement, but I can say that with this book, Sonny and I do talk, but by and large, everything goes through uh, our editor, Andy Corey. Um, I send in my scripts, Andy and Gerard send back any notes they have on it. Um, final goes to Sonny. Sonny does the, does uh, sketches. We all review the sketches and we all make notes on the sketches, like our thumb, you know, thumbnails. And, um, Sonny gets those back. Sonny revises. Sonny does inks. We all look at the inks. We have any notes. Those goes to color. I mean, like, it's it's just kind of like the uh, the it's I hesitate I don't want to call it an assembly line but it's very much like editorial is the one coordinating everything and most communication is going to and through him. So basically, editorial is the middleman. Yeah, kind of. And a lot of that's I feel like might just be because of the time difference. It's very hard for me and Sunny to find times that we're kind of synced up and it's very late for me or very early for him, mm-hmm. uh, or very late for him to be honest and. So, I, I mean, that that process might be different on other books at other company. I mean, uh, you know, really just on other any ti- other title with like other creative on it. Um, like Kim and Kim is an extremely collaborative book. The Quantum Teens was an extremely collaborative book. I have some other stuff I'm working on. That's just that's very much like we, we all like hang out in a group chat and just sort of hash things out. But those are all my like indie stuff. Um, and even to an extent, Transformers versus Visionaries, me and Fico have been working extremely closely on that. Um, <clears throat> and the, uh, our email threads are kind of these raucous, jokey parties. But, um, yeah, working, working with Sonny has just primarily been a matter of working with Andy. Huh. Well, now, you were talking about your work with other creators and other projects and you use the word collaborative would you apply that same word to what you and sunny do in eternity girl is that i mean you've said that there's not near as much give and take between the two of you yeah but that doesn't mean it's not collaborative it's but it's very different sunny um will take my scripts and interpret them in very unique ways so sunny's imprint is all over the page he basically takes my scripts as a starting point um and goes in some very interesting visual directions. He's been developing the visual language of the book based on ideas I'm having, but that's all him. And so his contribution to the, to the book, like the element to which it's collaborative is the, the incredible and unique stamp that he brings to every page. Well, let's talk about that stamp because I was curious about the very character of Carolyn Sharp. Um, when she's not in her, I guess, forced human form, She definitely has a unique look to her. Was that written into her or is this the result of Sonny taking your script and then giving it his own kind of visual spin? No, we'd been talking about what Carolyn would look like for a while. And, you know, from when it was just going to be like, it was just going to be kind of like riffing on, riffing on, uh, on uh, element girl um, to, as we moved past that into this original character territory, but Sonny kind of took the general kind of directions that we had and really did his own thing with it. Like the, the claw fingers, the, the, the bird feet, um, the scaliness, 
the her outfit, her hairstyle. I mean, like she's Sonny's character. She's that Sonny's that Sonny's design. Huh. Okay. We kind of like we all kind of collaborate in terms of like discussing variations. He'd always give us like three or four different versions of something, and we'd talk it through, and then he'd come back with a revise based on those conversations. But yeah, I mean, Sonny really took the lead there. Now, do you have a set? length um or number of issues of how long eternity girl will be around or are things a little open-ended um eternity girl is currently slated as a six issue miniseries if it does anything else past that we're not there yet okay so let's say a couple few months from now you could get word that they may want you to continue with this series it's possible that's how comics works all the time yeah Everything's, you know, um, limited to ongoing. But, I mean, it really just depends on what DC wants to do. So, yeah. It's not anything I have any control over at this point. Yeah, which is, I guess, somewhat similar, but at the same time, quite a bit different from doing your own indie or creative own, creator own title in that whether it ends sooner rather than later is your decision but it's also a matter of economics but here you have to throw into the to the mix what the people at dc will want yeah yeah i mean absolutely well okay so we can expect at least five more issues of eternity girl Mm -hmm. um what other projects are you working on right now either with dc or just in general um i'm trying to think what i'm what's actually been announced yeah, what um, you can tell us. <laughs> I'm working on in, uh, Kim and Kim recently went to an ongoing that's going to be launching in June. Um, so the first issue for that's being drawn right now. Congratulations! Thank you very much. Um, I have a two book deal at Harper Collins for middle grade graphic novels. So the first one of those is called The Aja Waja, and I think it's slated for like release in like 2021. I mean, I guess that's just whatever their schedule is is what it is. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's about. A couple of like eighth grader, like eighth grade girls who accidentally unleash this ancient evil that takes over the town and then they have to stop it. I'm not sure what else I can talk about right now. Yeah, I think that might be it. Like that's all the ongoing stuff that like is currently announced. I mean, you sound very busy. Do you credit your work? by this or to the success of Kim and Kim. I mean, is this, do you feel that Kim and Kim is what really puts you on the map for a lot of people? Absolutely. It, um, it, it, it broke down a lot of doors for me. It got me attention. Like Kim and Kim is how I got my, my, um, foot in the door at DC to begin with. Like Jamie really liked my work. So you just kind of never know what it's going to be. I never in a million years thought that's what Kim and Kim would be. Like, never in a million years. I thought it was going to be this, like, dumb little, like, like weirdo little book that I was going to do just for me. And I, I never imagined in a million years it would it would have the impact that it had on my career. Well, um, what uh, cons are you going to be attending to help to publicize not only Eternity Girl, but also some of your other titles? Well, I'm heading down to Awesome Con tonight. Um, so I'll be there this weekend. Next weekend, I'm going to be at C2E2. Um, I think I'm doing Heroes Convention, but I haven't nailed that down yet. Um, I'm doing San Diego. I'm doing FlameCon here in New York. And then I'm doing Thought Bubble in the UK, Baltimore. And I will at least be around at New York. You're very busy, but I'm glad that you found the time to talk with me for a little bit about your new title, Eternity Girl. This is a great first issue. If our listeners have not picked it up, then they definitely should. Mags, it was great talking with you again. And if you do make it to Heroes Con, I'll look forward to seeing you there. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to have back on the podcast Sonny Lou, his new DC series with Magdalene Visaggio, Eternity Girl, recently began. Sonny, welcome back to the show. Hi, Derek. I'm glad to be back after uh, another break, yeah? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and in fact, um, Gwen and I had you on the Comics Alternative for an interview almost exactly two years ago. This is around the time that The Art of Charlie Chan, the Hak Chai, was released. And then, you know, I had the pleasure of meeting you at UT Dallas. You came as a guest speaker, and we hung out and had a really good time. So it's been mm-hmm. a couple of years. You've had a lot go on. In the interim, the most notable thing, I guess, is the fact that you've won three Eisner Awards now. Yeah, yeah, that, that was like a sort of a mind blowing experience to be at Comic Con and uh, be involved in that, that uh, and Eisner's and, and winning three of them. I, I didn't expect to, I mean, I hoped, I guess, but I didn't expect to win uh, any of them, actually, to be honest. Well, the, the art of Charlie Chan Hak Chai was nominated for, I believe, it was six Eisners, right? Yeah, but you know, in, in every category, there seems to be so much, so many good books and authors and creators that it, it seemed like, uh, you know, it'd be a tough sell for any of them. So uh, I was very happy to to win uh, any one of them, and and three was uh, really something else. Yeah, and you won, I believe, for the Best Writer-Artist, Best U.S. Edition of International Material, Asia, and then Mm. Best Publication Design. That's right, yeah. And then also, since the last time we talked, I guess you finished up your run on Dr. Fate, leaving you available for Eternity Girl. Yeah, yeah, that that was a while ago, right? Uh, I can't remember when I finished it exactly, but I guess I was still working on it when we met up. Mm-hmm. Uh, back in 2016, yeah. So, uh, Eternity Girl number one just recently came out, and you know, Mags is the writer of that. You are the artist, and even though the first issue just recently came out, we did get little bits of what Eternity Girl was going to be all about in the five issues leading up to Eternity Girl number one of uh, the Milk Wars. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Now I'm, I'm. I want to talk with you about the the Milk Wars installments because they remind me a lot of what you were doing with Charlie mm-hmm. Chan Hak Chai. Mm-hmm. But I'm curious how you and Mags uh, linked up. I mean, how did you begin, begin working together? Um, I, essentially, I just got a message from DC. I think it was to Jimmy Rich. Uh, he said he had a story that they thought I would be s- suitable for, and and yeah, I mean, I, the, the story was interesting. I, I remember thinking that, that the concept itself was uh, had a good hook and had a lot of potential. Um, but I suspect, I think that after that, uh, Max read the Alu Charlie Chan. So she became aware of my interest in doing like different styles and different sort of uh, feels, uh, textured old comic look. And, and that's why when she did the, the Stingers, she decided to try out different sort of styles for that story as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because in those five issues that make up Milk Wars, um, we get, for the most part, I think all except for that final issue that, that just recently came out, uh, two pages of Eternity Girl story. And in each of them, mm-hmm. there is a similar feel to the kind of things that you do or you did in The Art of Charlie Chan, Hak Chai. And that is we see Eternity Girl – as a comic in different moments of U.S. comics history. So the style changes, Mm -hmm. the approach changes, and there even is this sense of a self-awareness kind of baked into this character as well. So it seemed to be perfect for the kind of work that you had been doing in Charlie Chan Hak Chai. Yeah, and and I think it was sort of a good confluence because uh, if I'm not wrong, a lot of of the young animal books also have a similar vibe. Uh, and being a little bit meta, like they, they look at comics from a less straightforward, linear perspective, at least from what I've seen. Uh, I haven't read all of it, but uh, they, they seem to, have to, in general, tend to be a bit meta on that level. So uh, I think it's been a good fit in terms of sort of my interest and the DC line and what Max is doing. Mm. You know, in fact, that's an, something else I wanted to ask you is your familiarity with the Young Animal line in, in in kind of preparation for what you guys are doing with Eternity Girl. Did you feel that you had to kind of immerse yourself in the Young Animal titles, at least we have those that we have so far, before really getting into Eternity Girl in order to, to I don't know, fit in the tone, so to speak, 
Uh, or did you and Mags feel that you just wanted to do something quite a bit different? Uh, no, no, I, I didn't. I haven't read most of these stories from Young Animal, like Zoom Petrol. I'm not really familiar with. Uh, although I did just just buy a volume recently because we are. Well, I don't give away too much, but we are doing some stylistic, uh, stylistic experiments as well in further issues of the book. Um, but no, beyond that, I, I felt like this this book felt from the offset felt self-contained. Like the Eternity Girl's world and her character felt like it was a world that could be explored on its own that didn't have that many links with, um, for me at least, that, uh, the wider universe, whether DC or DC Young Animal. Mm-hmm. So um, when you first were connected with, with Mags, how, how, do you guys, how did you guys begin to coordinate? Uh, how did you communicate? Because, I mean, obviously, <laughs> you're halfway mm-hmm. around the world in Singapore, you know, quite a distance from Mags. Uh, it was mostly through email at first. Uh, we did get to meet up for a short while at uh, Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con. So I think she had been nominated for an Eisner as well for Kim and Kim, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so I think Jamie which arranged for a dinner with, with, with several other DC creators, and so we talked a bit. Uh, but most of it, I think, has been through email or, or Facebook, Facebook messaging. Um, yeah, and I. I guess uh, most of the story, I think Max already has sort of figured out and had the plot structure and everything else. So our discussions are more to do with, uh, I would say, sort of visually getting that, those stories across but mm-hmm. rather than uh, any kind of structural issues in, in terms of uh, sort of my feedback to her. So I, I think she, she has got a, a clear view of what the story should be and I think my, for my part, I, I'm just trying my best to sort of uh, flesh out that story that she wants to tell. Hmm. So the the arrangement that the two of you have is, I guess, for all practical purposes, she is the writer, you are the illustrator, mm. and there's not as much, I guess, back and forth in terms of story uh, between the two of you. So, for instance, it's not as if she gives you the story and then you recommend maybe tweaking it here or there, or, or maybe you do. Mm-hmm. Well, not, not in terms of the, like, the essential story structure, I would say, but I think, uh, but from moment to moment, yes, I think we, we have a bit more of that. Like, I think that's true of almost all the books I've worked on, uh, whether with Max, Paul, or uh, Jean. Like, I, I would give suggestions on tweaks from panel to panel or on the way a certain page is designed or laid out. But I wouldn't want to step on sort of the overall structure of the story because I, mm-hmm. I think that the that, that's what the writer has in mind. It, it's like, again, I say I, um, my role is to help them tell the story rather than to uh, tell my own story in that sense. That's how I see it. Hmm. Well, one of the things you have going on in Eternity Girl is that this is a new character, and so it's not as if there is a lot of uh, history or story baggage that you have to contend mm-hmm. with. So my guess is that the relationship that you have with Mags is perhaps somewhat similar to your working relationship with Jin Yu and Yang, with uh, Shadow Hero, and then with Mike Carey and My Faith with Frankie. I would think that that's quite a bit different than what you and Paul Levitz were dealing with with Dr. Fate because you had such uh, a pretext to that character. Did Do you feel a little freer uh, in working with Mags on Eternity Girl than, let's say, you may have with uh, Paul and Dr. Fate? Probably in terms of design, yes, because we, we didn't have like, a helmet, a conic helmet to deal with in this one. Uh, I was basically free to design in fact, any way I wanted to. So, on the design front, yes, this was a lot, I had a lot more room for maneuver than I had with, uh, with Fate. Um, but I, I think even with Fate, because it, it was a sort of new character, a new, new iteration of the, of the character, uh, there weren't that many constraints in terms of trying to keep up with the old history of, the, of, of uh, Dr. Fate, as far as you can recall. Um, I know that uh, Paul paid homage to sort of the old Doctor Fate by having uh, the, the character's uncle appear at some point, but uh, no, I, you know, the idea of continuity or having to worry about the sort of past history never really came up when doing Doctor Fate. I think. Okay. Well, only you might ask Paul if, if he had uh, sort of those things in his head already, and maybe that's why I didn't get to see them because he has so much uh, knowledge on Doctor Fate and he 
in a better word too much about uh, forgetting stuff or leaving out things that, that you know, I, I would have never known about. Well, what about your relationship with Gerard Way? Um, I mean, he has a particular mm-hmm. vision for what the young animal line should be. Um, what have been your communications with him? That's also mainly through, through email. Um, and I would say he's sort of a not quite an editor, more of an overall creative director in the sense that he, he will uh, give suggestions and talks um, once in a while, whereas I think initially Jamie and then they throw on Andy Curry would be the ones who were more sort of be hands on day to day editing. Uh, so yeah, Gerard, uh, I think his role in this whole project is more of an overall creative um, person who looks at the, the scripts and the covers and gives his suggestions. Um, but, but generally, I, I think everyone has been so impressed with Max scripts that there's been really little uh, intervention editorially. Like mm-hmm. I think her scripts are so tightly written and uh, conceived that you know, we just have to better do a thing for the most part. Hmm. Yeah, at the back of this first issue of Eternity Girl, um, Gerard Way even makes mention that, you know, now that we're getting into phase two of DC's Young Animal, um, this this new title, Eternity Girl, just seems to be perfect for where he wants to go. Hmm. Now, do you guys, or I guess do you in particular, uh, as the illustrator, have a sense of about how long you think Eternity Girl will go on for? Or is it kind of indeterminate? You're just kind of open-ended now. Oh, it's, it's actually supposed to be six issues, as far as I know. It's, it's a mini series, six issues. That's what uh, was meant to be. Uh, that, as far as I know, that that's what it's going to be. It might it might get longer if it, it tells well, but uh, as far as I know, I, I'm doing six issues, yep. and okay. that's a plan I have right now. Yeah. Okay, so if let's say Mags comes to you in another couple of months and says, "Hey, you want to expand this beyond six issues?" Uh, is that something that you would be amenable to? Uh, th- that would depend on a lot of factors. R- right now, I, I my plan was to work on this book for. You know, till to June or July, and then to continue research and development of my own graphic novel. Mm-hmm. That was the plan, but you know, plans can change. So uh, it would depend on, on other factors. But at present, I, I would say my plan is to work on this for, till, till June, July, and then uh, to try to develop my next graphic novel if, if I can. You know, I remember asking, I guess it was a somewhat similar question a couple of years ago when we had you on the show regarding Dr. Fate uh, and about how mm. much longer that would be going on for. Um, I mean, did you find that working on Dr. Fate was something that was a larger project than you originally intended or you thought it would be? Well, Dr. Fate was always open-ended because there was an ongoing series, um, which whether or not it would last you know, 6, 12, or 15 issues was never clear until, you know, DC made the, the, the decisions. Um, in terms of scale, I think the, the issue with Dr. Fate for me was that I've been working on Charlie Chan, uh, the finishing touches, editing up till a very late point that I had a month for a book uh, by the time I started doing Dr. Fate. So there was very little sort of leeway in terms of uh, deadlines for Dr. Fate. Um, and that, that was a bit tough. Uh, there's just a fix initial books in time for, for the printing. Whereas with Eternity Girl, there's been a little bit more leg room. Uh, I think I started a, a little bit earlier. So it's not been as uh, stressful in that sense. Yeah. So I, I guess something like that is quite a bit different from your, let's say, your work with Marvel, where you did those adaptations, uh, you know, Pride and Prejudice and Sense and Sensibility, because there was a clear endpoint to those. Uh, for, for that one, yes. But even for, for this one, I'm looking at six issues and mm-hmm. it was always intended to be so. It's all also in that, in my mind close ended as well. Uh, so I would say that the difference for me is more, more in a process. Um, I mean, comparing work I do for like DC Marvel versus my own, own work, there is a bit of difference in terms of the, the process. I don't have to do the research. I don't have to do the structural writing and, and all those things. So it, it's easier in some ways and, and harder in others. Uh, yeah, so I, I, I 
I kind of group all those things that I do for with other writers in, in one pile and my own work in another. That's my main division in terms of how things are different. Well, uh, from an illustrator's side of things, how challenging is it, if challenging is the right word, to uh, tell the story of Carolyn Sharp? Because she's quite an unusual character, including a very unusual looking figure. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, it's it's always tough to do to do a comic. I mean, whenever I get a script from a, a writer, I'll be sweating, wondering how I'm going to pull it off. Like, there'll be scenes there that, that sound like they're impossible to draw, you know. And it's always sort of uh, until I've actually drawn it, I, I don't think I'm not really sure if I, if I can ever pull it off. Um, and in terms of Eternity the girl, I, I think how do I put this? Uh, I had a sense that. I could draw on a bit of more of my indie influences for this book because uh, it, it's, what, it's a book that deals with depression, it deals with uh, character facing, with suicidal thoughts. And, and I thought that um, in some ways, artists like Daniel Clovis and Charles Burns uh, had really done books or done art styles that, that give the right feel or the right vibe to, 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 the, to the work that... I wanted to try to incorporate at some level in Eternity Girl. So you see a lot of the shots are like frontal close-ups of the characters' faces, which mm-hmm. I think is one of the features I see a lot in, in for example, Clover's work. Um, yeah, so, so I, I, I was kind of excited by the notion that I could bring in some of those influences into, into this title. That's interesting. I, I hadn't thought of, let's say, the visual influences of Klaus or Burns. Mm. When I was reading through this, but this really makes sense now. Well, well, let me ask you this. Does the the way that Carolyn Sharp look, at least when she's you know, not trying to be or to look human, mm. um, is is that something that you created entirely or was this a look that you and Mags had discussed? So, for instance, I mean, she does have – uh, you know, different looking arms and legs or mm-hmm. hands and mm-hmm. feet. The hair that she has is tied down under her chin, which is quite unusual. Uh, was this mm-hmm. something that was left almost entirely up to your creative imagination? Uh, in, in a sense, yes. I mean, I, I, I did draw on a lot of influences uh, for the design. Um, I, I would say on one side, I wanted to give her, because she is supposed to be some kind of uh, ancient goddess. So I drew on influences of uh, statues of ancient Sumerian Babylonian goddesses. Uh, for example, the, the clawed feet are a feature of uh, Ishtar, one of the goddesses of, of I think, Babylonian history. Like you, you'll see sculptures of, of her uh, with the clawed feet. Um, so those were from... from statues and on, on the other hand i wanted to make it feel a bit more contemporary so that the hairstyle with the loop under the, the the tight under the neck that's actually something i saw on a mannequin in, in, the, in london a few years back when i was uh, huh. walking the street so I, I i guess in my mind i'm trying to combine sort of a traditional older sim measure together with more contemporary feel uh so that, that was my my was trying to do and i think the everybody like like the look they they, they saw it they, they they had no complaints um yeah so that, that was the process essentially I, I would do several sketches and you know the editors and the writers would, would kind of tell me what they liked and the kind of direction that i i should work further uh, into yeah well you know one of the things that was clearly apparent in the i guess the story is, the story segments that were in the back of the milk war issues was the way that you used different styles to represent different periods within the history mm. so to speak of this character eternity girl with this first issue of eternity girl the first full issue that just recently came out for the most part your style is consistent although there are occasions where the style seems to shift, perhaps in a subtle way, from one point mm. to another. And I was curious if we can look forward to more of these stylistic shifts, maybe even more overtly, in issues to come. And the reason I'm asking is the very nature of this character, Carolyn Sharp, she seems to be stuck not only between, but also among various worlds, right? Because we see her in her 
I guess you could call it the elemental form, which we were just describing, but also when she tries to be human. And then there are also occasions where she is in some kind of wholly other space. So this is a character that lends herself to the shifts in context, which I think should go hand in hand with shifts in style. So I'm wondering if we'll see more shifts in style in the issues to come. Uh, the short answer is yes, um, but I'm not sure how much I can elaborate. I think I'll leave Mac to tell you more <laughs> about that because, yeah, I'm not sure how much he wants to reveal about the future issues uh, before they are they're out. Yeah. But yeah, there are definitely going to be uh, different styles in, in the book as it progresses. Mm. Well, in, in terms of a uh, future directed question, let me ask you a couple that you have much more control over, and that is what other things you may be working on right now. Now you mentioned uh, wanting to get back to work on your next graphic novel. Mm. Um, what can you tell us, if anything, about that? Well, it's, it's still the same book that I, I mentioned to you about, I think, two years ago, uh, the, the book that's about <laughs> capitalism. Uh, you know, it's, it's a book that, it's a topic that requires a lot of research. And I'm still essentially on a research phase for the book right now. Um, and trying to find space and time to, to kind of get a better grip of it and to start thinking of how the story structure would actually work. Uh, so I, I see that. I, I hope to go kind of more full to that uh, after Eternity Girl. Um, and, and that aside, I think I'm looking on some other shorter projects for various publishers as well. Well, in, any of those things you can tell us about? Uh, any projects for other publishers? Uh, I probably can mention that I'm doing some things for Boom Studios uh, Adventure Time series. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give it that for now. Yeah. Okay. Now, are you finding things are quite a bit different with your place in the industry, having now won three Eisner Awards? Uh, to some extent, yes. Um, I think that uh, it would be easier now for me to pitch a book than it was before. I think before Charlie Chan came out, um, I've been probably working as, as an illustrator, and what I had done on my own would, would be very short pieces, maybe 10 or 20 pages long. So I don't think I've ever shown that I, I was you know, interested in or capable of doing a, a longer narrative. Um, whereas now I think if, if I push publishers, I could at least give them that book and, and give them a big sense of the kinds of thing I'm, things I'm interested in and, and what I want to do and it would be easier to uh, get them interested now than it was before. Yeah. And I suppose even for like uh, publishers of more mainstream work, they, they would also uh, be more willing to, to take a look at, at what, what I, I, want, I, I'm, I want to work on. So yeah, I mean, definitely it's opened up some doors for me. I think the, the book itself and also the awards that followed afterwards. You know, and, and talking about your longer form work, um, you know, you were describing, again, the project that you're working on now, the capitalism project. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it seems that your single authored works are progressively becoming more ambitious and more complex. You know, we have the uh, Malinky Robot, but then something quite a bit more complex than that, The Art of Charlie Chan Hock Chai, which took a lot longer I guess, to create. And then now we yep. have this more recent project that you're currently working on, which, in, which requires even more research than you had done originally. Mm -hmm. Is that is that correct? Um, see, I, I'm a little wary of calling it more complex. I think it would be equally complex. So the challenge right now, it's more to, for me, is to try to figure out ways to tell a story that uh, would be as interesting or engaging as, as the Alan Charlie Chan without having to re repeat you know, some of the same gambits, same sort of structures and, and, and tricks, as you may call it. Um, I think that that would be, for me, the, the, the main challenge, to make it as complex rather than to aspire for like even more complexity uh, for the next book. Um, and at the same time, to keep it readable, to keep it engaging, I think th those are sort of the main issues that I'm wrestling with at, at the moment. Hmm. Will this new book uh, also be with Pantheon? Uh, well, they, they have contacted me to write the first refusal, um, but I think it would also depend on the exact nature of the book when, when it's done or when it's being completed, because uh, I think that, that partly determines 
that uh, first publisher it gets the best with, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, so I I I think they they have the first look at it, but I, whether they they want it or whether it's it's sort of the best home for the book, I think remains to be seen. Now, I would guess one of the benefits of, let's say, with your art of Charlie Chan Hak Chai coming out through Pantheon is, you know, this is this is a, you know, part of a big trade publishing house. And so you have the kind of resources, publicity and otherwise, that you may not have with more comics or graphic novel centric publishers. Mm-hmm. I mean, obviously the big two. But, you know, you've done work with – um you know, first, second with, with shadow hero. And so I would, and now granted first, second is also part of Macmillan, which is another publishing giant. Uh, but I would guess that when it comes to graphic novels or comics, whatever you choose to call them, Pantheon not only has the resources, but also it has quite a prestigious history of the kind of works comics related that they've actually put out. Um, I mean, in other words, they were able to to send you around for the book tour, which is how you came up to uh, mm-hmm. to visit us in Dallas. Um, I mean, did, did you find that that made a really big difference in the reception of Art of Charlie Chan, Hak Chai? Well, I mean, I, I'm not too aware of what goes on behind the scenes in terms of booksellers and, and distribution. Um, my sense has been that Pantheon is really strong, as you said, with the bookstores, traditional bookstores and, and outlets. Um, whereas I think comic publishers like Boom, etc., would be better equipped to deal with comic book stores, uh, direct sales and, and all those things. So I think in, in my mind, at least I'm not sure how, how this, whether this is true or not, there's still sort of a difference between the book market and the comics market. And right. different publishers have different strengths in, in each of them. And I've yet to come across a publisher that is strong in both fronts, I think, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I could be wrong. I'm, I'm not sure if, if, if Pantheon actually has, has really good uh, reach in, in some of the com- comics books front or if someone like First Second is going to uh, kind of develop uh, distribution in both channels, but just my general sense is that, that there is this divide and that uh, publishers in general tend to be stronger in one than, than the other. Yeah. Like again, yeah, that's a speculation. I, I I don't really work within uh, enough in that industry in, in that sense to to really have a clear idea of whether it's true or not. That, that's something at least I remember Paul suggesting or, or telling me when, when we met in New York that he too saw sort of this gap. But uh, yeah, so so it's, it's impressionistic is rather than you know uh, I can't say whether it, it, it's true or not. Mm. Well, you know, we, we've talked about some of the work from you that we have to look forward to, but something much more immediate is this series, Eternity Girl. And I think you guys are off to a great run. And I look forward to seeing how this plays out. Sonny, I thank you again for coming back on the Comics Alternative. I hope that next time you're back in the United States, we're you're in a location where we can actually see each other again and, and, and hang out like we did a couple of years ago. I hope so too. That's a fun, fun time together. Yeah. Take care. All right. Thanks, Derek. Once again, I want to thank Sunny Lou and Magdalene Visaggio for coming back on the Comics Alternative to talk with me about Eternity Girl. I hope you enjoyed these conversations and are excited about how the series will unfold. And I'll tell you that the best place to get future issues of Eternity Girl and all of the titles in DC's Young Animal line is a discount comic book service. As I pointed out at the top of the show, if you go there now, you'll find not only issue number three of Eternity Girl but a variety of other titles by Mags and Sunny at great discounts. So be sure to check out DCBService.com. And after you do get your comics there, get in touch with us and let me know what you thought about my conversation with Sunny and Magdalene. If you go to our website, ComicsAlternative.com, you'll find that you can leave us a voice message online via SpeakPipe. Or you can call us the old-fashioned way by picking up your phone and dialing 4153-COMICS. 
That's 415-326-6427. You can also email us. We're two guys at comicsalternative.com, or you can email me directly. I'm Derek at comicsalternative.com. And you can find us all over social media. We have accounts on Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, Instagram, Google+, Goodreads, Pinterest, YouTube, Slack, and Discord. You can subscribe to the podcast through Apple Podcasts. You can stream us on Stitcher. You can also find us on Spotify, on TuneIn, on iHeartRadio, and on Google Play Music. But you can find every single one of our podcast episodes, as well as the reviews and comics-related commentary that we post on our blog, simply by going to our website, comicsalternative.com. We'll be back with more interviews in the weeks to come, so be sure to check back for those. Until then, take care.